all right, if you've got a book, and we're working through Ed Wharton's old study guide, The Church of Christ, some of the things that make the church distinctive, identifying markers. We've talked about the idea that there's a pattern, there's a blueprint, but we've also tried to talk about the idea that what we're really wanting to think about is how can we know that we're being pleasing to God in all that we do? Because that's that's really what it comes down to. And so we are in chapter five, which, and, and we're actually starting on page 72 tonight, talking about Christ as the foundation of the church. If I were to ask, or if you're in a conversation with someone and they were to ask you, what is your core motivation or your core reason for following Jesus? What are you going to tell that person? What, what's, what's, what answer do you give to that question? Because are there some real, are there some answers that wouldn't be convincing to anyone? Because this is what my wife said I ought to do. Is that one going to work well? Probably not. So if I'm following Jesus, what are, what is, what, if you bring it down to a core reason that I'm going to follow him and not somebody else, what would it be? And there could be multiple answers. Very good home. Chase is there. The grave, he is the guy that death couldn't overcome. And, and this... There was a, a preacher that used to talk about that, and, and he would say, you know, that the guy that says, I'm going to be killed, but I'm coming back to life, the guy that can call that shot, that's the guy I'm going to follow. And really, when you, and, and that's kind of where he is on page 72 of the study guide, he, he talks about Romans 1 verse 4, and we'll look at that verse, but then I want to look at one other section of scripture that, that really gets into this. Uh, Romans 1 verse 4 and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. How do you declare him as powerful? He's the one that was raised from the dead. And he called that shot. He said it was going to happen. Uh, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. There's a couple of important things here. Somebody read verses 1 through 4 of 1 Corinthians 15. Mm -hmm. I die for our sins, he was buried, he was raised from the dead, third day, just as. Okay, so there's the resurrection piece. If you continue into this chapter, though, it, it gets down to if he's not raised, what are the implications of that? Just another guy. And, and one of the points that he makes here in the book, in the, in the first paragraph under that heading, Christ is the foundation of the church, he says, the doctrine of Christ as the foundation of the church is not mere theology unrelated to the Christian's life. It's the real motive of the Christian's faith and service. If Christ was raised from the dead, he can raise us. And that's the second piece of this. Why do I follow him? Well, he's the one who overcame death. And if he can overcome death and he's made this promise, he can raise me too. Because if he delays his return, what's going to happen to all of us eventually? We're going to die. And if this life is live and then die and there's nothing else, well, I might as well do whatever I want while I'm here, right? There's, there's no reason not to. But let's continue reading uh, 1 Corinthians 15. I'm going to start in uh, verse 22. Same chapter we were just in, dropping down. For as in Adam all die, all humans, even so in Christ, all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. 
Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and authority and power. Uh, for he must uh, reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. He, for he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it's evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Um, he says, now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. And here's where he kind of gets into the what if there is no... Um, am I in the right verse? Actually, I'm not seeing what I was looking for. Man. Okay, well, let me just go on with what I was doing. Oh, I started. I, I'm sorry. I started where I wanted to end. That, that's the problem. Okay, go back to verse 12. I started in the verse I wanted to end on. Now, if Christ has preached that he's been raised from the dead, how does some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? What Jewish group said there's no resurrection of the dead? Sadducees. That was their big deal. Uh, that was their teaching. But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we're found false witnesses of God because we've testified of God that he raised up Christ when he did not, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. In other words, if Jesus delays his coming, we all die. And if there's no resurrection, there's no hope. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. In other words, if we live this life and it's just about the years that we have here, what's the value in that? Well, I can make the case there's value. Is there value to living the Christian life if that's all there is here on this earth? What are some of the upsides? Maybe you stay out of jail. You probably lived a good life. You, you, you may end up with a body that's not as high mileage as if you didn't care about how you live. I mean, there, there's, there are some upsides, but he's really putting it in perspective here. If there is no resurrection, none of this. I mean, why would we live this way just for the few years that we have here when what we're thinking about is forever? So, um, for since by man came death, by man, the man... Man capitalized also came the resurrection of the dead, whereas in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. And so, uh, you know, that I like to work in terms of one of the things this book does is it kind of proof texts its way through certain ideas, which, if you continue to read in context, is okay. I like being able to take more of a paragraph and notice what the paragraph is saying. And that's kind of what you get here in 1 Corinthians 15. It just kind of lays it out. If there's no resurrection of the dead, we're just wasting our time. And so uh, Christ is the foundation of the church. The reason we follow him is because he overcame death. Now, if someone were to ask, everything we read out of the Old Testament, if you wanted to boil everything in the Old Testament down to one idea, what would that one idea be? Someone's coming. I mean, everything through the Old Testament, you may be in a story about David or about Solomon or whatever's going on. All of that is under this umbrella of there's sin in the garden. Man is separated from God, but God has an answer and somebody's coming. That is the story of the Old Testament. So that means, was there a prophecy or multiple prophecies about the church that would exist? There are. And he gives you a lot of examples there in the book. We're not going to take time to read about those. And so during Jesus' ministry, Jesus' big question and Peter's confession, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And so then Jesus comes back in Matthew 16, verse 18, and, and responds to Peter in that regard. Because if, if, if the Old Testament is someone's coming, what are the Gospels? Someone's here. 
because that is Jesus' ministry. He's arrived, and of course, once he leaves, then the final message is what? Someone's coming back. So Matthew 16, 18, I say to you that you're Peter upon this rock, this confession, I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. What, when you're saying the gates of Hades won't prevail against it, what are you saying? What's the other word you could use there? What is not going to prevail against the church? We just talked about it. Death. You know, Jesus overcomes death. So the other thing uh, that you kind of get out of this chapter, and I'm trying to, I wanted to try to get through and done with this chapter tonight. Because uh, it's so easy to get bogged down in this book because there's so much here. But again, if you're having a conversation and somebody asks you, okay, questions about the inspiration of the Bible, what's, what is the most powerful proof that the Bible is inspired? Prophecy fulfilled. Okay. That there, there is nothing more powerful. You take 40 men, is it 40 men or so, riding over a time span of 1,500 years, and, and you end up with something where prophecies are made, prophecies are fulfilled, and it's time and time and time again. And again, he gives us a list here just of some messianic prophecies that are fulfilled in the death and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus being rejected and crucified by the Jews. Jesus raised from the dead. Um, how many remember? Let's let's do a test. Sunday morning, what scripture did Chase use as he talked about the Lord's Supper? Anybody remember? I know that's not fair. 53. Yeah. It's not fair to have us remember back three days, but you're exact. That's what he did. And Isaiah 53 is all about him. It's all about Jesus. And it, it's telling the story of him being rejected and suffering and all that he would go through. And so those prophecies um, being fulfilled, those are the most powerful proof uh, of inspiration. He's got uh, one listed here about the resurrection, confirmation of Jesus' deity and his claims. So he then gets into talking uh, a little bit about the apostles and their role. Uh, the confession that, that Jesus Christ is the rock, the foundation, we've talked about that. I, I didn't want to spend a whole lot of time there because we've talked about that idea in this class. The church is built on who? Or whom? Whom? Is it him? Who's the English? Any English people in here? Nazi, English Nazis? Uh, I guess if you can, if you can put the word him... If it's built on him, then you could say it's built on whom. Is that how it works, maybe? Okay. The church is built on Christ. He's the foundation. You've got passage after passage. And the church belongs to whom? Christ. And, and so the apostles declared that. He's got Paul declaring that. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11 this is on page 74. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Uh, Peter's declaration, he's got um, talking about living stones. But then he asked the question, okay, what, and this is 75, what place did the apostles have in the foundation of the church? And, and let's kind of look at Ephesians chapter 2. I think it's 19 and 20. I kind of use that as a, somebody read that when you get there. No, 20 is good. Okay, so as Paul writes there, what does he mean when he says that the apostles and the prophets serve as an aspect of the foundation of the church? What does he mean by that? And of course, and he, and he references Christ as the, the chief cornerstone. He is the foundational stone that, that holds it all together. But what role would the apostles 
and the prophets. And who would these prophets be? What's he talking about there? That's, that's important to understand. Now, there is some teaching out there that would say the church, instead of being built on Jesus, was built on who? Matthew 16, Peter. And you've got to kind of misread that text to get that idea, especially when you start reading all these other things with Christ as the chief cornerstone, things like that. But what role would the apostles play? Okay. Right. There's boots on the ground as in activity, but what else did they bring? What other crucial thing did they provide? Well, experience, they brought the word because Jesus is gone at this point. This isn't all written down yet. And so one foundational piece is we need the right information and the right information is coming through the apostles. You know, our study of the Holy Spirit, they received this measure of the Holy Spirit that was the baptism of the Holy Spirit, if you will, where they've got knowledge and they've got the ability to work miracles, which confirms the fact that you ought to listen to the message that they just proclaimed because of the, the power that they've been endowed with. So um, we wouldn't have the information we need without them as part of God's plan. But then who would the prophets be? Well, what's he mean by that? Is he talking about Old Testament prophets as foundation of the church? Or is he talking about something else? See, when I ask and then you can go silent, it gives my, my voice time to rest. Okay, um, Sunday mornings, most weeks we're preaching through the gospel of Mark. Who's Mark? Is he an apostle? Nope. Is he inspired? Yep. And so if Mark is, is, is writing down a message from God by inspiration, what does that make Mark? Makes him a prophet. And so when you start thumbing through your New Testament, you've got guys like Mark. And, and, and others who they write, but they weren't apostles. Yeah, and, and one of the problems with the word prophet is typically what I did, we, we tie a couple of things to it. We tie Old Testament to it. What else do we tie to the idea of a prophet? Future telling. But the actual idea is speaking for God, a message from God. And so sometimes in the Old Testament, it was future telling. But it's also the message from God, whatever that may be. And so uh, that would be the idea, the place of the apostles in the foundation of the church, the place of the prophets uh, in the foundation of the church. Um, think about Luke. You know, what would we not have without Luke? I mean, God could have done it another way, but God used Luke. So, right. And, and, and one... Of course, one is the, the Jesus ministry, but then the other is the early history of the church. Just huge. And so, you know, where would we be without Luke? Uh, so you think about some of those authors and those writers, and, and, and that's, that's kind of the understanding. He does bring up one thing that's, that's interesting. Uh, I think so. Sure. Right. It's that's. I mean, it lent the, the Old Testament. They lend authenticity to the idea that, or you know, the, they give weight to the idea that the book's authentic because of the work they do. So yes, absolutely, that makes sense. He makes a sin a statement right in the middle of seventy five that might strike us as a little odd, but he uh, where it says Jesus sent the apostles to forgive and to retain sins. And then he gives us John 20, 
21 through 23, that the text of it's right there in the book. As the Father sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they're retained. Howdy ho. Doing all he, right. What's he talking about? What is he? You know, it does, or does that strike us as odd? Does that strike us as giving them too much power? Or because he, he makes a pretty good point about that in the next paragraph. You gotta go get my boy. Yeah. Apparently, he's acting up. He says, I just muted Nick. Sorry, Sorry Nick. I muted you for a second. Um, it says, Jesus did not here endow the apostles with the authority to arbitrate whether one should or should not be forgiven of his sins and pronounce them saved or lost. He said nothing here or elsewhere regarding successors to the apostles with the authority of absolution. Jesus clearly states that he sent the apostles even as the Father sent him. That is, not to do his own will, but the will of the Father. Their work was all about fulfilling the work of the Father not to put themselves in a place of judgment. How do we know that their role wasn't to judge? Who, claim, who has claimed, made, who has laid claim to the role of judge? Jesus. And he actually said, you know, it's not John 12. It's actually the, my words that will serve as the judge, my teachings that will serve as, as the judge of you. But, but he's got that role. And it's interesting because he's also got another role for us. He's kind of a defense attorney also, is he not? He kind of sits in two chairs. Um, so I, I thought that was an interesting statement about the, the apostles and their role. And so he says there in, the, in that bottom paragraph, thus the apostles were sent to forgive and retain sins as the Father sent Jesus not to do his will, but the Father's. And this was accomplished by the guidance of the Holy Spirit, who, who Jesus says will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. So then on 77, he gets into that idea of 76, the apostles laid the church's foundation, all gospel truth revealed through the apostles. And then the prophets, he mentions Luke there. Uh, and so we wouldn't have what we have without them. And so then when you get over to page 78, he says, the faith God wants us to have does not come from sub subjective feelings, ex 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 existential, I hate that word, sorry. It'll never be in a sermon. I can promise you it'll never be in a sermon. <laughs> Existential experiences, modern visions or dreams, or from present day human testimony, but from the apostles' word. Now, do any of those other things have a place in our lives of value? <laughs> um, a properly trained conscience should result in what? at times. I mean, the, the feelings you have about something, what are they based on? Are they not based on your conscience? So, can you always trust your conscience? Depends, right? Depends on how it's been trained. Um, and, 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 you know, whatever it is, needs we need to be able to support it with Scripture. So, you know, those things are important. Some people believe that dreams tell them a lot of stuff. Dreams can be crazy. Um, some people seem to kind of be experts in that regard. I don't know. I, 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 God isn't going to give us something 
that he hasn't revealed. He's not going to re reveal something to me in a dream about the way I need to live my life that he hasn't revealed in his word. Because the ways to think about it, if he reveals something to me in a dream that's consistent with the word of God, there's no difference. If he reveals something to me about the way I need to live my life that's different than what I find in the Bible, then what have I just done in the Bible? Right. So, you know, and, and, and scripture tells us God can't lie. So if if I have had some sort of a vision that I believe should direct my life, but it, it's in contradiction to what the Bible says about how I to live my life, whatever that dream is, there's no way it can be from God. Does that make sense? Um, but I'm no dream expert. And and maybe some of you all, and I mean, I think we've all probably awakened and go, what was that? And what did that mean? Um, what about present day human testimony? Value in that? Or is it, do we do that in the church? In churches of Christ, do we do that? And if we don't, why not? And is there value in it? Oh, Josh is ready to talk now. Here we go. Okay. 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 See the guy that's got some disabilities. Yeah. Right. 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 Now, I guess, you know, what do you call testimony? Multiple times in class, you know, about, you know, what it was like to be growing up and then her family going to church. Right. How did well and think about what you do find in scripture how did paul preach over we've got it at least three times which means if we've got it three times in what we have there's no telling how many times it was a feature and you know, the Gospel of Mark, many believe Mark traveled with Peter and that Mark's writing was based on kind of being an assistant to Peter and hearing Peter preach all the time. Uh, and, and you've got to believe that in the in, in the preaching of a guy like that, that there's a lot of, you know, first person in, in telling those stories. So for somebody to talk about, here's where my life was. And then I gave my life to God, and this is how my life looks today because of that. Is there value in that? I believe there is. And so why don't we do it? Or why don't we feature it? Or are we scared of it? Right. Right. Yeah, sometimes we get afraid of the slippery slope and where something could go, um, but we don't need to miss the idea that there's value in somebody telling their story, how God changed his or her life. Um, that's powerful. I mean, I, I think it's powerful when Josh talks about where he was and, and where he is now. And 
I think that was, it must be powerful or Paul wouldn't have done it over and over and over. And um, so, you know, I'm not suggesting it needs to be a feature of our service, but there is value in people telling their story. Maybe do it Right. In front of everybody, but this right. 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 Yeah. Right. 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 Oh, the tell yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Okay. yeah, we did but, that. Well, and there's just a lot of people are ashamed of their story. Where you are now, but I think that's why a lot of people don't want to get up in front of it, everybody. Right, and that's the yeah. basis of the question upstairs. How many of us have never been wrong? Well, you know, we've all been wrong, and sometimes it's been over and over, and we'd love to be able to rewrite certain pages and all that. So you can say, Yeah, I'm ashamed of these things, but now I'm you know, trying to do this. To me, that's the right. those things that you know, now they can, you know, they can right. do better. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I, I appreciate the discussion. Um, that kind of gets us through uh, that chapter. Do what now? Well, someone does a great Some churches do, and I've been in churches that do. And I, you know, as a professional visitor, um, if I'm there visiting, you know, and, and space baptized, I kind of I'm waiting to see what happens. And if it's a church that claps for baptism, I'm clapping for that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we're an amen church. Okay. But and and it and it goes back. I think it goes back to a concern about doing things decently in order and about how amen is talked about in the Bible. Uh, but there is, you know, and then there are some people that would say, well, why do you, why do you clap for somebody that just does what everybody should do? You know, and they're like, well, people need, there is something in the Bible about encouraging folks, you know, people need to be encouraged. So, um, yeah. Over at Beltline, where Trey went, uh, when somebody out of the youth groups baptized, the entire youth group, and I mean, it's a large group, they are all up in the baptistry. It's probably an OSHA violation. There now. So, I mean, they are crammed up there, but it's it's a really neat thing because they're all up there to celebrate that together. Uh, anybody we need to remember in prayer? Okay. Well, I know we got a lot of going to Nashville. Let's, let's pray. God, we love you. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for your word. I'm thankful for our, our class and our discussion tonight. And I pray your continued blessings on us. Give us wisdom as we read your word. Help us to read it uh, with an open mind. So we, we can learn the things that you want us to know about how to live while we're here so we can be in heaven forever. Uh, we're mindful that we've got a lot of our church family going to Nashville. Uh, tomorrow and Friday and, and being there for the weekend and pray your blessings, your safe travel. We, we're also mindful of our young people and pray uh, that they'll do their best in every event. And uh, we just were so excited about them growing and, and, and learning to live for you. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all.